Good evening, everyone. To open our program, a very special treat this evening. Please welcome Concord Music Group recording artist and season one winner of NBC's The Voice, Javier Colon. There we go. Such an honor to be with you tonight. Uh, when I think of the title of this song, I think of something that we all say when we're very grateful. Very grateful to be here. Uh, and this song just seems to come to mind for me tonight. So I hope you enjoy. David played and it pleased the Lord But you don't really care for music, do ya? Well, it goes like this, the fourth, the fifth The minor fall and the major lift The baffled king composing Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Uh, 
It's not a cry that you hear at night. It's not somebody you see the light. It's a cold sound from heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Please welcome Innocence Project Executive Director Maddie Delone and Innocence Project Board Chair Jack Taylor. Good evening again, everyone. It's our pleasure to welcome you to a celebration of freedom and justice. We are thrilled to be here with the Innocence Project's closest supporters and friends, and with tonight's extraordinary exonerees, Michael Bromwich, Ava DuVernay, and Denise Federero Quattrone. <laughs> Above all, we're honored to be here with the Innocence Project's clients who have been exonerated during this past year who honor us by joining us tonight and allowing us to welcome them home. Tonight, seven Innocence Project clients who were wrongly convicted are here with us for the first time. Together, they endured more than 150 years of wrongful incarceration. Each one of them exhibited extraordinary persistence in declaring their innocence. Each of their families, many of which join us tonight, struggled alongside them and demanded justice against all odds. It is their courage, strength of spirit, and ultimate triumph that inspires us, each and every one of us, to work harder and to push for a system based on fairness and accuracy. This has been an extraordinary year for the Innocence Project, both in terms of the number of people we have helped bring home and the number of laws passed to improve the system. Later tonight, you will meet some of the men who were freed in the past year and hear some of their own stories in their own words. From every exoneration, the Innocence Project identifies the contributing factors to wrongful conviction and works nationwide to reform how police, the courts, defense counsel, and prosecutors do business. Around the country, we are winning policy changes in the legislatures and in the courts. 
on issues including eyewitness identification, mandatory recording of police interrogations, compensation for people who have been exonerated, oversight for forensic science, reliability and tracking of jailhouse informants, and more. And here in New York alone, in the past year, we won groundbreaking changes to pretrial discovery policies and a first in the nation commission to evaluate claims of misconduct by prosecutors. All told this year, we helped pass 18 laws in 15 states. Millions, thank you. Millions and millions of people around the country are now under the protection of new policies designed to identify, rectify, and prevent wrongful conviction because of our collective work. And through our many communication channels, we help raise the voices of men and women who have been exonerated. And their stories opens people's minds, and together they prevent future injustice. Through this work we do together, their experiences illuminate not only the issue of wrongful conviction, but some of the foundational problems that plague our criminal legal system at large. The systemic racial bias and racial and economic disparities that corrode justice at every stage. The unchecked power of the prosecutor, the frailty and inadequacies of many of our de federal uh, public defense systems, and the cruelty, inhumanity, and indifference with which the criminal legal system much too often treats the people who cross its paths. The exonerees and their stories expose all of that and make us care. There is so much work to do, but tonight we celebrate. We celebrate the progress that has been made so far and affirm our commitment to the work still to be done and importantly, to the wrongly convicted people still waiting for their day of freedom. Before the evening begins, we want to thank some of the people here tonight that make the successes we will celebrate this evening possible. First, a very special thank you to our benefit chair and one-of-a-kind board member, Jason Plob. Thank you also to the co-chair of tonight's event, whose names are here on the screen, as well as in your program. And thank you to our freedom and justice sponsors and our visionary sponsors. All of them made this evening possible. Many of the Innocence Project Board of Directors and Exoneree Advisory Council members are here tonight, and I'd like to ask them to stand and be recognized. Please stand. to ask the students from the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law to stand. <laughs> Cardozo has been our partner. Cardozo has been our partner since Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld founded the Innocence Project 27 years ago. And to this day, it is thanks to the diligent efforts of the students who work with our attorneys that we work as efficiently as we do on so many cases. I wholeheartedly thank them and thank Dean Melanie Leslie for being a wonderful partner to the Innocence Project. <laughs> Finally, from the very bottom of my heart, I want to thank the Innocence Project's extraordinary and talented staff and ask them to stand. We, we the 
staff are 80 strong. And everything that we accomplish as a team requires each and every member of our team. I thank them, I thank each of them, and we, the 80 of us, in turn, thank all of you for making the work possible. Okay, if you don't already follow us on social media, I encourage you to join us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I think you're supposed to see a hashtag soon, which are all a great way to keep up with our work. You can start by posting about tonight's events at hashtag Innocence Gala, just as you see it there. But as a friendly reminder, this evening, both on the stage and in the ballroom is a photo only, no video, no stories, no live stream, no something else. It's a photo only opportunity, but take full advantage of that. Now, to present our first award of the evening, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Innocence Project co-founder and special counsel, Peter Neufeld. Good evening. Um, I'm actually kind of thrilled to present the evening's first award for freedom and justice to Michael Bromwich, uh, for he has been a very wise consigliere to the Innocence Project for almost two decades, a great friend, and as you will hear, the embodiment of public, savor, of public service at the highest levels. He is also the husband, partner, and friend of Felice Friedman, and the father of Daniel and Jonah, all three of whom are with us this evening. You should talk to him at some point, because years ago I watched Michael up close with one son at the University of Michigan and the other at Wisconsin deftly negotiate the delicate balance of divided loyalties during basketball's March Madness. <laughs> he can be the consummate diplomat. No wonder that he was appointed the independent monitor for several police departments in this country to implement essential reforms in the use of force and police accountability. <clears throat> of course, tonight we honor Michael in particular for his efforts to advance important reforms in forensic science. 25 years ago, when Michael was the U.S. Department of Justice Inspector General, he published a groundbreaking critique of the FBI's crime lab, which revealed misconduct, incompetence, and a lack of adherence to fundamental principles of science. A decade later, he oversaw a sweeping review of the Houston Police Department crime laboratory. His team uncovered erroneous results and simply too much deference to whatever the police wanted in a case. His report led to shutting down that police lab and ultimately to the creation of the Houston Forensic Science Center, a national model of independence and integrity. Most recently, Michael, as our wise counsel, helped the Innocence Project successfully negotiate with the FBI and the Department of Justice a comprehensive review of all the FBI's hair microscopy cases over two decades. That review led to the FBI's astonishing mea culpa, acknowledging that two dozen agents had misled juries and provided erroneous testimony in 96% of their casework. We're not applauding the errors, we're applauding Michael. Um, in short, his groundbreaking work paved the way for much of the Innocence Project's reform efforts. But just to put Michael's public service into a broader context, you should know that in the late 1980s, long before we had the pleasure of his company, he served as associate counsel to the special prosecutor. You all know what a special prosecutor is. Um, and, and Michael, in that capacity, successfully took on high government officials who broke the law in the Iran-Contra scandal. Perhaps one of this nation's earliest examples of what we call post-truth politics. 
In 2010, he was picked by President Obama to develop safety regulations for deep sea oil drilling in the aftermath of the environmentally catastrophic Deepwater Horizon explosion and oil spill in the Gulf. Just last week, you may have read, it was announced that some of those safety measures that he developed were weakened by the current administration. And finally, eight months ago, when we as a nation were all glued to the TV screen, watching the courageous professor, Christine Ford, testify at the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing, Michael was seated next to her, having resigned from his law firm to be Professor Ford's learned counsel. So, so now you know why I'm thrilled to present this award to Michael Bromwich. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for your kind and generous words. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here with so many friends and colleagues, as well as members of my family, my wife, and my two sons. And it's also a pleasure to be honored at the same time as Ava DuVernay, whose work I admire, and Denise Federaro Quattrone, whom I know well from our shared association with the Quattrone Center uh, at Penn Law School. I remember very clearly where I was on January 9th when I received Maddie DeLone's email advising me that the Innocence Project had decided to honor me at this benefit. I was crossing the street at 19th and K in Washington, D.C. Now, I remember the specifics of memorable moments, and this was a memorable moment for me. Why? Because if you had asked me before that moment, to name the organization whose work I admire the most, the answer would have been the Innocence Project. And that's separate and apart from the professional relationships and friendships I have developed with Peter, Barry, Maddie, and many of the other great people who do the important work of this organization. And the reason is simple. The Innocence Project has changed the landscape of the criminal justice system in truly remarkable ways, in ways that were unimaginable when I became a prosecutor in the early 1980s. Its own work has led directly to 187 DNA-related exonerations and through the power of its influence, over 350 DNA-related exonerations nationwide. But its work has gone well beyond the powerful use of DNA evidence to clear those who have been wrongfully convicted. It has truly shined a bright light on the sources of those wrongful convictions. Eyewitness misidentifications, false confessions, governmental misconduct by police and by prosecutors, witness perjury, and bad forensic science. The significance of the IP's work goes well beyond righting wrongs in specific cases, important as that is, and identifying more broadly the causes of wrongful convictions. I would argue that its singular achievement has been to inject a large and much needed dose of humility into the criminal justice system. It has underscored the fragility of that system. It has disturbed the complacency that existed in so many corners of that system for so long. And it has caused people to think long and hard and actually change their minds about issues such as the death penalty. Now, my own awakening came several years after I stopped trying cases as a prosecutor at the end of the 1980s. I was the Inspector General of the Department of Justice in 1995 when a whistleblower in the FBI lab came forward with a series of disturbing allegations about the failures that he said had tainted 
some of the most significant cases that the lab had handled in the previous decade. Those cases included the 1989 assassination of federal appellate judge Robert Vance, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing case, and the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing case, among many others. We brought in some of the top forensic scientists in the world to help us review the allegations, and much to our collective surprise, we found that the work of the lab in many of those cases was deeply flawed. A combination of lack of scientific training, insufficient quality assurance, and poor management. That was an eye-opener, not only for me, but I think for the Department of Justice more broadly. And because the FBI lab had been responsible for training so many of the forensic scientists in labs throughout the country, a significant wake-up call for many practitioners. Yes, of course, we had known at some level that the system wasn't perfect, but I didn't fully realize the extent of its imperfections until we systematically went through these cases and saw how many were flawed. And along the way, this investigation revealed to me the widespread scientific illiteracy of prosecutors, defense lawyers, and the judiciary, which was a big part of the problem. My next extended exposure to the frailties of forensic science and to the risks it created for wrongful convictions came several years later, as Peter mentioned, when I was hired by the city of Houston, at least in part as the result of Barry's urging, to investigate the highly publicized problems in the Houston Police Department crime lab. After two years and the examination of over 3,500 cases in every field in which the lab did analysis, we found pervasive and disturbing problems with its DNA and serology work. Again, there were many causes and many culprits, including inadequate resources, insufficient quality assurance, and again, poor management. But that investigation, as Peter has suggested, led to wholesale institutional change in Houston and the formation of a truly independent lab, the Houston Forensic Science Center, which just celebrated its fifth anniversary. Now, these in-depth explorations of forensic labs were formative experiences for me and my awareness of the extent of wrongful convictions in the criminal justice system grew in large part because of the Innocence Project's work and the role it played in planting the seeds for Innocence Networks and projects throughout the country. At some level, we are all here tonight to celebrate the remarkable role that the Innocence Project has played in awakening millions of people in this country to the frailties of our criminal justice system and mobilizing so many people to do something about it. Simply put, the IP does God's work. It has truly been my honor to be affiliated with the IP, to work with it on specific projects, and to serve as a member of its Lawyers Committee for the last seven years. And it is a profound honor to receive this recognition tonight. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage actor, director, producer, and Innocence Project board member, Tony Goldwyn. Evening. The hallmark of a first-rate storyteller is the ability to ignite our imaginations while at the same time waking our consciousness and challenging our view of the world we live in. I first met Ava DuVernay in 2013. She directed my all-time favorite episode of Scandal. <laughs> it was called Vermont is for Lovers, and that is why we are honoring Ava tonight. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'd been really excited to work with Ava uh, before we did that because I was completely blown away by her film, Middle of Nowhere, um, which was her first exploration of our criminal justice system and its impact on family. Um, like all of Ava's work, the film creates social commentary through the deeply personal lens of human relationships. Middle of Nowhere won the Audience Award at the Sundance Film Festival, which was a first for an African-American female director, as well as an Independent Spirit Award. Um, Ava went on to shake our consciousness again with Selma, a film, yeah. 
A film whose raw, unflinching emotion serves as a painful reminder that the oppression and bigotry that plagued this country over 50 years ago is still very much alive today. Ava's astonishing documentary, 13th, awakened <laughs> millions of Americans to the crisis in our criminal justice system and to this legacy of systemic racism that continues to undermine our democracy. The film was nominated for an Oscar and won Ava the BAFTA, Humanitas, and Peabody Awards, among many other honors. Ava's latest project, When They See Us, gives new voice to a story that is very close to the Innocence Project and to many of you in this room tonight. The story begins uh, with the 1989 attack on a woman jogging in Central Park. Five innocent teenagers were arrested, interrogated, and publicly tried in the pages of the city's newspapers. Raymond Santana was 14 years old. Kevin Richardson was 14 years old. Antron McRae and Youssef Salam were 15 years old. Corey Wise was 16 years old. They were all wrongfully convicted and spent years in prison before being exonerated after the man who in fact committed these crimes confessed and was confirmed by DNA evidence in 2002. The tragedy of this case captures so much that is wrong in our criminal justice system. The corrosive effect of racism on the presumption of innocence, the vulnerability of young people in the interrogation room, the rash judgment of the media and public figures who have no concern for the truth, only for their own self-aggrandizement. Most importantly, and consistent with all of Ava's storytelling, this is the tale of lives, families, and communities that have been forever altered by systemic injustice. I am honored to share with you a small portion of this extraordinary piece of work tonight. So here is the trailer for the upcoming Netflix series, When They See Us. Is Mom here? It's just us. You and us. Who you were in the park with? I don't know names. I just got lost. Where did you see the lady? One, one lady. The female jogger was severely beaten and raped. Every black male who was in the park last night is a suspect. I need all of them. What's going on with my son? Your son was involved in a rape in Central Park. What? No, it's, no, it's, no, wait a minute. No, wait a second, wait a second. They saw you rape the lady. I didn't see a lady or hit anyone. I didn't see any lady. Kevin. I didn't see any lady. I want to see my son right now, right now. Whatever they said I did, I didn't. I know what. Zoning on the road. Nothing these boys state matches the central facts of the crime. All we need is for one to tie this whole thing together. These tapes are not as clean as the state would have you believe. Justice happening here. There is not one shred of evidence. Imagine the frenzy of these teenagers. Ripping off her they car. Innocent of these crimes. They are guilty. Why are they doing us like this? What other way they ever do us? And I haven't looked back. I've been having these dreams. Since I, I keep hearing these footsteps. And they come in closer and closer. That's me. Coming to bring you home. They said if I went along with it, that I could go home. And that's all I wanted. The police will do anything. Lie on us, they will lock us up, they will kill us. This is my life. I don't think we should admit to something that we didn't do. Okay, we keep fighting.
To present the 2019 Award for Freedom and Justice to Ava DuVernay, it is my privilege to introduce Raymond Santana, Antron McRae, Kevin Richardson, Corey Wise, and my fellow Innocence Project board member, Dr. Youssef Salam. Wow. Wow. Y'all look beautiful. <laughs> man, oh man. Thank you, Tony. My name is Dr. Youssef Salam. I'm a board member of the Innocence Project, and I'm proud to be here tonight, along with my brothers, to present this award to our sister, our friend, Ms. Ava DuVernay. Since the day we were wrongfully arrested, others controlled the story. They judged us without ever seeing us. The prosecutors, the police, the media, the people of New York, Donald Trump. They created a lie that suited them and erased us. For 30 years, we fought to take back our story. Now through Ava DuVernay, we see it be brought to life for a whole new world to see. We see our families as they fought for us against a system that shut them down. We see the innocence that New York denied us and still denies so many young people of color. We see our truth that we fought for so long for others to see. Ava, you are a masterpiece, a beautiful work of art. We are honored to give you this award and thank you for hearing our story and telling it to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Please help me in honoring our hero, Ms. Ava DuVernay, as she comes up to receive the award for freedom and justice. Hi, folks. Thank you so much. Um, that moment, I can't describe how big a moment that was for me. There's no award the film or the TV industry could give me or this project that'll mean more to me than this moment. Um, since 2015, I've given my heart, my time, my mind, every tool of filmmaking that I have within my grasp to tell a story just to make these men proud. I just, I just wanted them to like it. That's all I wanted. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tony, so much. Um, I loved working with you. I look forward to the time that we do it again, but I love the work that you're doing here. So thank you for um, being the first to reach out to me about this. Um, and to my fellow honorees, it's uh, amazing to hear your stories and to learn more about you, and uh, I honor you. Um, I don't know, to hear these men's words here tonight, or like a dream come true for a four year long journey. We started this in 2015 and I just wanna to say to you all that you're my brothers now. 
Um, I thank you for the opportunity to be your sister. Every time I call Antron, he calls me, sis, sis, guess what, what? What, Antron? Love you. Um, uh, to the Innocence Project, I thank you for putting a spotlight on all of us tonight. And to every exoneree and their loved ones here tonight, I stand in solidarity with you and I salute you. Um, yeah, give yourselves a hand. So when they see us, the film is an act of love, and I wanted to change the title of this project from what most people expected. Most people expected it to be called Central Park Five. I wanted to change it because I felt that that was a moniker that had been politicized. It was something that was given to the men by the state and by the press at the time that were not doing their job as well as they could. I felt it dehumanized them, and our intention with this film was to humanize them, to make you see them fully, and then to ask you, what do you see? Um, we wanted to ask this question not just for them, but for every man and woman who's ensnared within the system. And so the film is a love letter to the marginalized and the criminalized, those who've been set aside and forgotten, dissed and dismissed. When they see us, unfolds in four parts. And while the case of the Central Park Five is the framing device, anyone who's been victimized by the criminal justice system will see the same rusty cogs of the broken wheel that is the system we find ourselves in. Part one explore, explores police interaction at the time of their arrest in the precinct, our general lack of knowledge about our rights, and the challenge to assert them in certain police scenarios. Part two explores court systems, trials, juries, judges, and the debtor's prison that this country allows through the farce known as bail. As my friend Brian Stevenson always says, the system favors you more if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. So part two focuses on that. <laughs> part three explores juvenile detention and the horrors of minors being incarcerated. And it also explores the ways that we treat formerly incarcer incarcerated people in this country as second class citizens. Part four explores, explores incarceration itself, and we do so through the story of Mr. Corey Wise. For any other person, this story may have ended in tragedy. You see, Corey was arrested, convicted, and remanded directly to Rikers Island at the age of 16, then shuttled to various adult prisons in the state for 14 long, horrific years. It could have been a tragedy, but Corey is a warrior and he emerged triumphant. You'll see his story in part four of the project. You'll see his story in part four of the project and you'll learn the stories of each of these great men that I stand with throughout the series. And our project is an indictment of the criminal justice system in all of its phases. And I think it's important that, um, that our American society really understands the different parts, the legacy of the system, the different parts of the system. That's what 13th was supposed to do. Uh, so when they see us, it's basically 13th in narrative form and story form. Um, but not unlike the great work of the Innocence Project, the film is also a call to action to interrogate the stories we tell ourselves in all aspects of our lives that allows us to turn our backs on millions of people who struggle through the scourge that is this broken system. And the work we've done here in this film is an act of love. I love this organization. I thank you, Innocence Project. I love you, Corey, Raymond, Andra, Kevin, Youssef, so much. Love you. So much. <laughs> I thank you for the honor of being your friend and your chronicler. I thank you all tonight for your attention and your warm energy. And everyone in this room is an artist, just like me. Because like art, justice requires imagination. It requires us to imagine a world that isn't yet here and to make it so. May we all make it so. God bless and good night. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Innocence Project founding board member and benefit chair, CEO of Lava Media, and host of the podcast Wrongful Conviction, Jason Flom. Okay. All right, show of hands, how many of you are actually guilty? Not the exonerees. I know you're, we know you're innocent. I meant the rest of you. Okay, let me try it again. Now, 
Now that I made the instructions clear, ah, there we go. We got at least one hand up. Okay, that's why you need us, just in case. And that's why we're going to ask you for money tonight. Um, what an incredible thing to follow these unbelievable honorees, and of course the Central Park Five. Uh, I've had some of them on my podcast. And, and the hidden part of the story is, that I think is so important to talk about is, that the actual perpetrator who should have been known and was known to the police should have been, per should have been apprehended in the, in the first place, and he went on to rape four other women and kill one of them in front of her children. And these are the victims that we need to also think about um, because uh, it's, it's an unconscionable thing that happened to the guys, but it's also an, 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 another tragedy or four other tragedies that could have been and should have been prevented. So anyway, I'm so excited to be here again, the best night of the year, and to be the chair of this amazing event and to serve at the Innocence Project where I've been for over 25 years. Um, and and you know, with the podcast, I get the experience, I get an amazing experience of, of getting to dive deep into the stories of these most extraordinary people. The exonerees, um, give, give them another round of applause. There are so many here. And it never ceases to amaze me because civilians ask me all the time because I'm always proselytizing about our work. And people ask me, how come they're not bitter? Like, I'd be so bitter, I'd be in the tower with a rifle looking for who did this to me, or I'd be out on the streets, you know. And everyone has an amazing uh, attitude and perspective and, and strength and courage that we can't even begin to understand, those of us who haven't been through it. So I applaud all of you, and I pledge that I will continue to support you for as long as I'm still breathing. And I know all of us at the Edison Project feel the same way. <clears throat> So you are my heroes, and you're our heroes, and that's not going to change. So um, you lead us by example with your bravery and your truth-telling and your hearts and your, um, uh, and your spirits. And now what we're, what we're here tonight to do, of course, aside from honoring our amazing, amazing exoner uh, honorees uh, and exonerees, is to raise as much money as we possibly can. We're breaking a record tonight, I'm happy to say. Uh, Frank and Denise um, have, uh, have led the way. Um, you know, Frank, I understand, was on the 15th hole when he got pulled off by Denise today to tell her that it was time to go to the dinner, but that's okay. Um, he's a very good golfer, by the way. Um, so they made a million dollar gift tonight, for starters. which will do an amazing, amazing amount of good. But on top of that, they've also decided to pledge another $100,000 tonight to match the money that we raise here. And dollar for dollar, up to 100000 Who knows, I think we might even be able to get them to go higher. Somebody give them a little more wine. We may get them up to 250 you never know. Um, so we have a text to pledge deal tonight. We have envelopes on your tables. They look something like this. Um, and I'm going to lead the way um, with a gift of 25,000. I'll use that as an extra match. So we're up to 125 for matching, um, or else I'll match you if we don't get there. So whatever, we'll figure it out. Um, we need an economist here somewhere. Um, so you can donate by text and I'm gonna walk you through this. I'm gonna ask my son, Michael Flom, to come to the stage, because every time I've done this in the past, I've totally fucked it up. So this time, I'm gonna bring an actual expert in the use of the phone, um, the younger generation. His grandfather would be very proud right now. Michael Flom to the stage, please. Okay. And you ready for this? A lot of pressure. Okay, so, um, and, and I do want to just give a shout out. My dad's not here. Um, he's not with us anymore, but my dad, Joe Flom, was a big supporter of the Innocence Project, and his firm, Scadden, to this day, gives us thousands and thousands of hours of pro bono support. And so, 
He's in, he's very much in the room in spirit. So, okay, here's how this works. You ready? So grab your phone. Everybody, you, you, know you, you know you want to. Pick up your phone. Let's see if we can get 100% audience participation tonight. Those of you that are guilty of something and the rest of you. <laughs> Ironically, the exonerees are probably the only innocent, really innocent people in this room. Um, so, okay, start it. Go to your text messages. Open your text messages. I want full participation, everyone. We're not going to solve for anything last. Michael's going to do it. He's going to show you how to do it. So you start a new text message and you type the numbers 41444. I don't know why that's the number, but that's the number. 41444. You getting there, everybody? Can I hear it? Yeah? Okay. And then in the message part, you write IP Gala or IPGALA, depending how you look at it. <clears throat> um, and that's IP Gala, one word. Don't need caps, doesn't matter. We'll take your money either way. Then a space. Then the amount you want to give, which should be a lot. And then one more space. You got it? How are we doing? Yeah. No, we're doing great. We're oh, doing yeah, great. amazing. Then you type your name. Or if you don't want your name up on the screen, you can leave it at that amount. Um, if you want to, you know, type in some other name, you can do that, you know. Um, anything. Pope Maddie is recommended. Um, or, uh, you know, anything you can think of. <clears throat> I've been told to stay away from politics tonight, so I'm going to. Um, but you can think of some funny things. So the funniest thing you can think of. So, and then you hit send, and your name will come up on the screen. And now we're going to text, now we're going to try it out. So, uh, did we send mine in yet? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, let's uh, see if it comes up should, on the screen then. Let's you should see get a, uh, a text confirmation when you've been successfully charged. Okay. That's how you know if it's gone through. Good job, good job. Yeah, 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 looks very good. good one. There we go. Am Ooh, I up? Are we that. up there? All right. What did you, did you put anything funny? Um, and, uh, oh, we're moving. We're up to 76. Holy shit. This is great. How about um, that? And by the way, how about this fancy new logo? What do you guys think? So, yeah, we like it. We don't like it. Fancy logo, Innocence Project. And shout out to our social media team, our new social media team, killing it. If you're not following Innocence Project on Instagram, start now. Innocence Project on Instagram is fantastic these days. Really, really top notch. Um, okay, so, and again, if you prefer the old school method, um, if anyone here is older than me, then um, you can take the envelope on the desk, write it, there's pens, we make it really, really easy. How are we doing, Mike? How are we doing? We're, no, we're doing great. 118,000 already. Yeah, Jesus. We, beat, we beat the goal. Look at um, that. Yeah. Round of applause for everyone in this room. Oh, my God. Look at this. Yeah. It's rolling in. Okay. And um, I think, uh, yeah, let's just keep it going. I'm going to stay up here and see if we can at least get to 100. And, let's get, see if we get to 150, and then I'll get off the stage and we eat. Ready? 130. That's a good one. Okay. We got Anthony Gracci on there, Go Team T-Baum, Appel, okay, $184 from Larry David. Okay, that's interesting, there's imagination there. If I see a Stormy Daniels up there, I'll be impressed. Um, that would be 120000 I think. Um, okay, let's see, Michael Avella. Michael, you're a hero as well. Um, Donna Kenton. But what do we got? 131. We don't, 131. Yeah, what do you 131. think? Can we get We're it? Moving. Let's, let's get it. One, oh, up to 131, 447. I like it. Mark Betts, 59, whoever he is. Okay. Paul Saladaroff wrote that amazing article in Rolling Stone about Tony Wright, one of the best ever. Uh, let's see. S. Katz, another Jew. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, Dr. Salam weighing in. Salam rhymes with flam. I love it. Um, Billy's Devil Child. I'm not sure if we can accept that one. Um, Sarah Burns, 256. That's random, but okay. Kohler, oh, 145. Come on, we need another wow. 4,000. We are. Kohler gave a big $51,000. Kohler gave 51,000? Yeah. Oh my God, whoever you are, Kohler, round of applause for Kohler at 51,000. <laughs> the Southern Center for Human Rights, incredible, incredible group. Love their work. 148, 255. We're gonna get there. 257. Somebody gave two dollars. Who gave two dollars? I love you. 
Hendrik Van Hemmen. I don't know who that is, but he's an interesting guy. Okay. He probably gave the money in tulips. Um, Audrey Strauss, of course. Audrey, amazing. Another board gift at 512. Must be somebody from Houston. Um, okay, Brian Golovoff. <laughs> David Zornow. Come on, we need another, another. Oh my God, another. What is it? Uh, another, uh, another thousand. thousand. And, and another thousand. And uh, well, you do the math. Yeah, You're in college. Um, <laughs> Anthony DePippo, fifty-one dollars. <laughs> Lava Media, fifty dollars. Hey, hey Shorty, I wonder if that's. Uh, hey Shorty, hey Shorty, you there? What's up? <laughs> Up from Florida. Not Michael Cohen. Not Michael Cohen for $5. That is incredible, by the way. <laughs> Just the fact that it's $5. There you go. We got it. Oh, we hit it. OK. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your dinner. And stick around, because the best part is coming up. I guarantee you the best part is yet to come. Thank you. Now, please enjoy dinner and continue to text in your pledges. We will be back shortly with our final award presentation and introduction of the exonerees. Reminder that this ballroom is a no recording zone. Photos are permitted, but please, no video, live streaming, or stories. Thank you, and enjoy the second half of the program. Now, please welcome to the stage Innocent Project co founder and special counsel Barry Sheck. It is now my privilege to present the award for freedom and justice to Denise Ferraro Quattrone. A force of nature from the streets of Philadelphia by way of the University of Pennsylvania and Silicon Valley. A special friend to the families of all those who have been wrongly convicted or charged. A visionary, a loving friend, and an Innocence Project board member with boundless energy, encyclopedic knowledge of the latest developments in the struggle for criminal justice reform. She's also great fun <laughs> and is not above wearing glitter at grand events. Denise did not start out to be a leading advocate for criminal justice. She is an occupational therapist by training and came to the cause in much the same way as so many others, by living through the pain of watching someone she loves and adores confront wrongful prosecution by federal and state authorities. Frank and Denise had the resources to fight and win. But once their personal ordeal was over, they did not forget. They dedicated their lives to creating a more just nation. From her family's own experience, and because of her immense generosity, passion, and empathy, Denise has remained devoted to people who were wrongfully convicted and their families. She has the uncanny capacity to think about the system as a whole and each person in it with equal weight and equal clarity. She advocates for the families of people who have been exonerated, reminding us to honor and remember their effort their trauma, their resilience. Denise also recognizes the importance of gathering good data. 
how it can illuminate what's really happening in the criminal justice system and mobilize the public to bring about real change. She instinctively knows what information will motivate people. She was the force behind a major study in 2015 of the huge costs of wrongful convictions and other injustices in California. She immediately appreciated the importance of the National Registry of Exoneration, counting the exonerations and telling those stories. Her support and Frank's have been essential to the great success of the registry, where she not only serves as a member of the advisory board, but as a researcher whose tenacity and success at finding exonerations that were hidden from sight was so extraordinary that the academics and nerds at the registry sent a team to watch her work. <laughs> this is true. And to try to understand her mind. They failed. <laughs> All of us at the Innocence Project have marveled after receiving emails and texts from Denise at all hours, directing us to the latest article, the study, the profile, or group that we should have known about and wondered, does she ever sleep? <laughs> and it's not just a three-hour time change. This enthusiasm and devotion extends beyond the Innocence Project. Her efforts drive national activism and advocacy on criminal justice. She works with innocence organizations across the country on campaigns against the, against the death penalty, particularly in California. And how about a shout out for Governor Gavin Newsom? <laughs> and Denise helped establish the wonderful Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania, her alma mater. Every time Denise encounters a problem, an injustice, or a person in need, she acts. She always asks, what can we do? How can she help? And she consciously pushes us in the very best ways to do more, reach farther toward a more just nation. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to present her with this award. Thank you. I hope you can hear me back there. So thank you, Barry. I'm so grateful you didn't tell some of the more colorful stories, wherever you are. Thank you. I do have some thank yous to some others, uh, sprinkled with some of my comments. I want to thank Barry, Peter, Maddie, and all of the wonderful staff at the Innocence Project. Uh, you are superheroes. You do the work of God. And you're also superheroes because you have endured a decade of endless emails from me. <laughs> and uh, I'm a layperson, and so I have a lot of suggestions for how we can improve the criminal justice system. And um, they listened, they acted, and they then invited me to the board. And I am so happy that you have given me this voice. As a family member, um, we don't often get a voice because we don't have any legal standing in prosecutions uh, that happen to our family members. And we do bear the consequences very dearly and direly, um, especially our families, uh, the children are affected. And um, especially since some prosecutions unfortunately do target family members. And someday it is my hope that eventually we'll study this and maybe come up with some kind of a um, Family Protection Act 
so that we can stop some of the more uh, outrageous uh, prosecutorial tactics. When you see an exoneree, and you'll see a lot of them here, or when you see them on TV, I like to use a numeric where I multiply by 500 because it's my feeling that that's how many people have been affected by that wrongful conviction. These exonerees have families, they have neighbors, they have people that they graduated high school with, they have churches and communities. And all of them, when something happens that is not truthful, all of them take a big hit on the trust, the public trust that they have in the criminal justice system. I also want to give thanks to my fellow board members, for my fellow honorees, Michael and Iva, and to our precious exonerees. It's you that inspire my work, and you've actually helped me form my mantra, which Barry kind of alluded to. My mantra is to work bigger, bolder, brighter, and better. Thank you. I also want to give thanks to the man that I fought in the trenches with for six years. I fought for his character and reputation in overturning his wrongful prosecution and white collar conviction. I want to acknowledge Frank Quattrone. I want to thank him. I want to thank him for having our families back and cover during the worst times of the wrongful conviction. And I want to thank him in allowing my voice to have his back and cover. I want to tell you, Frank, that I love you. And we have many great lives, many great years together. And this work is emotional, it's prickly, um, but we have a lot of work to do and I, I love you so very dearly. I also want to thank our friends and family, many of whom have come here tonight, and our legal defense team who has pulled us through some of the worst times. Many of you have traveled here from far, and I thank you and appreciate your support. But I ask the rest of you in the room, if your friend or family member were wrongfully prosecuted and convicted, I mean, what, what would you do? I mean, there's no social, you know, kind of guideline of what you do in that particular situation. I mean, do you bring them a casserole? I mean, do you, do you um, go there and pray with them, sit and talk to them, bring some tissues, flowers, um, arrange a prayer meeting? Our friends did all of that and more. Back 15 years ago, our friends organized a group and they raised some funds to voice the um, Northern California Innocence Project that was about to go belly up. And they raised $600,000 to keep it afloat. And since that time, they have all continued their support over these last many years, this last decade. And that Innocence Project is now a robust, a robust Innocence Project that has exonerated close to a dozen exonerees. So I want to make sure that they feel and understand their impact. And these exonerees, many of them have gone on to get married, to have kids, to repair the relationships of their lives. They're doing well. It's a struggle. Uh, but they've also lent their voice, and they've gone to Sacramento numerous times. And they're the reason why we've had so many bills emerging out of California, because they're constantly pounding on the legislators' doors. And they are one of the reasons why Gavin Newsom just signed the recent moratorium on our death penalty in California. So a salute to you all. And tonight, my friends, many of them who have supported the Innocence Project for a long term, joined with some new friends, have actually made a commitment and have joined Frank in fundraising close to a million dollars so that we can uh, continue the work here at the Innocence Project in New York, and um, I'm very excited to see some of the exonerees that are going to emerge from those funds. So know that you do good work, and I thank you, I thank you all for adopting my mantra.
they have. They work bigger, they work bolder, they're working brighter and better, and I thank them for that. But we have a lot of work to do. And um, I guess the, the important question is, how many people are still inside fighting to get out? And the true answer is, we don't know. But we can get an inkling, because we get letters from people inside the various prisons all over the country. And so we know um, that it's probably thousands, and I would venture to guess it's 10 thousands. And the reason we can speculate on something like that is because um, there's also uh, been some recent movement with exonerations that aren't individual exonerations, but there have been group exonerations at incredible proportions. Um, and so we do have a lot of work to do. And, um, we can now take a look at some of the data that is coming out. Um, you've already heard that we have had 350 exonerees that have been freed because of DNA evidence. What you didn't hear is, is that the um, National Exoneration Registry, only in its fifth year, has profiled uh, close to 2,500 cases around the country. And aggregately, they have lost 21,000 years. But the thing that you haven't heard is a, a, a unique kind of thing called the mass exoneration. It's a group exoneration. When something goes terribly wrong, like in forensics, where you might have some forensic analysts do some terrible thing where they don't do the, the test right or they make false accusations or they, or they, um, they don't do the test at all and uh, they list guilty or positive or whatever that is. And that actually did happen in Massachusetts. And that's where you get the mass exoneration. And just recently, uh, 35 to 40,000 innocent people had their convictions overturned. So those are the numbers that we are looking at. Um, and that's why we really need to roll up our sleeves and get in there and do some further work. And if you think about that, um, I always say multiply it by 500 because that's how many people. Uh, that are, that have had their trust in the criminal justice system shaken, you can understand why we're finally reaching some critical mass. This affects many, many people out there. The other thing that you'll take a look in some of the data is, is that how long some of these people are held. And when I say held, I'm talking H-E-L-L apostrophe E-D, because I don't believe that they serve time, they're held. And you take a look and some of them have served on average of eight to 10 years. But if you dial down a little further, you see that the statistics identify several dozens of people who have been held for 20, 30, 40, 45 years. And that's where the rage comes out. We shouldn't accept that. that that's absolutely crazy. And there's no other sector anywhere that I can think of that accepts a delay of 45 years to right a wrong. I mean, think about it. Um, you have a car, you put your key in the ignition and you turn it. I mean, and if it doesn't work for 45 years, are you gonna say it worked? No, no, it's, it's, it's incredibly flawed, the system, and we need to do something about that. Um, it's, it's not present in the medical, the medical profession either. The medical profession um, is, is way ahead of the criminal justice system. If somebody gets their wrong leg amputated in a faulty surgery, you better believe that the next week there's going to be procedures in place to prevent that from happening again. Or if a plane goes down, the FAA is right on the scene, like within days, to see what happened so they can fix it. Not so in the criminal justice system. And we need to stop that. We can't be complacent and accept it. So as you know, we have a lot of work to do. Exponential proportions. We need funds, we need data, we need research, we need manpower, we need legal remedies, we need legislative remedies, we need systemic change. And so if I could leave you with one image, I'm gonna leave you with an image from the Broadway musical Hamilton. If many of you have seen it, and don't worry, I'm not gonna wrap this, Okay. <laughs> if you, the, there was one point where the New York colonists are enjoying a great day and all of a sudden someone looks up 
and there's 32,000 British ships in New York Harbor. And there's 32,000 ships in New York Harbor. 32,000 ships in New York Harbor. And General Washington comes on the scene and he assesses the situation. And he says, we're outgunned, we're outmanned, we're outnumbered, and we're outplanned. Oops, sorry. And so we have to take an all in all out stand. We have to rise up. We have to take an all in all out stand. And that's what I invite you to do here tonight. I want you to look within. I want you to see how you are going to rise up and how you are going to use your voice in changing the system. And I'm asking you to adopt my mantra. Work bigger. Work bolder. Work brighter. And work better. Because history truly has its eyes on you. So let's rise up and bring them all home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please be seated because I now have the honor to introduce Javier Colon. So if he can come up to the stage and he has a wonderful rendition from Les Mis, Bring Him Home.
so much. Please welcome back to the stage, Maddie DeLone. Okay, I'm honored to close this evening by honoring the Innocence Project clients who were exonerated and freed this year. Each of these wrongfully convicted men are free today first and foremost because of their own tenacity, resilience, and bravery in proclaiming their innocence and struggling for their freedom in a system that was indifferent to the truth. Each case also reflects years or decades of litigation and investigation from the intake team that reads and evaluates each and every letter requesting our assistance to the attorneys that never yield in finding a path to reveal the truth, and to our many co-counsels and local partners and the families that are integral to making our victories and making our nationwide work possible. We thank everyone whose work, sometimes unseen, makes these long-awaited moments of justice possible. I'm happy to make the introductions to come alongside my friend, and colleague, Marvin Anderson. Marvin. Marvin is a member of the Innocence Project Board of Directors, the board liaison to our Exoneree Advisory Council, the fire chief of the Hanover, Virginia Fire Department, and a former Innocence Project client exonerated in 2001 after 20 years of wrongful conviction. Wow. This was, this was a wonderful year for the Innocent Project, and I'm thrilled to be here to welcome home the newest members of our family. Before we invite them to join us on stage, they will be introduced themselves to you by video. Freedom is of the mind. It's all about how we view life. I never let my mind go to prison. My body was put in this prison or on this slave plantation. See, I've always had the peace to be able to go through this ordeal. Thank God for that. Given the circumstances in which my incarceration happened, freedom means to me the ability to hold my head up with my dignity intact. That right there, breathe, I feel, uh, don't answer to no one, do as you want to, as you feel is best for you. The course of my own life, having a sense of direction, allowing to live my own dreams, follow my dreams, and make my dreams come true. Freedom means that I'm free to serve God within the parameters that He has provided for me, and that always will bring the best results. It kind of opens the floodgates, you know, when you uh, continue to encounter it, so to speak. Life is good, baby wife. I'm doing good. I haven't dreamed in such a long time that's uh, that's a difficult question. My vision is just to help as many people as I can before I die. My race of people, the kids, that's, you know, our future, making sure that they can be productive in life. I want to be of access to that as much as I can possibly be. I want a family, you know, marry one day, 
our kids, I want a bunch of them. I don't know, I'm, I guess I'm too old to have so many now, but I will have a dream to have a normal life, you know, that's all. Just be happy with everything they come along with, bills, taxes, all of that, struggles. I'm one of the fortunate ones that actually got an opportunity to prove that I wasn't responsible for the crime I was in prison for, but there are thousands, literally tens of thousands more people in this country that are wrongfully imprisoned whose voices are being silenced. When you are served papers, they have lot versus the state of Oklahoma. And that's what it really means. It's not a misprint. It's you by yourself against the entire state all the state's resources, all the state's men will try their best to make you fall off that wall, just like Humpty Dumpty. And no one can put you together again. But the Innocence Project has a solution for that, to combat that beast that we call the state. Can you imagine 19 years on the inside that you come out and these people embrace you and they treat you like you're human? I fought hard for myself because I was fighting for me. But to have somebody come alongside you and believe what you say and to act on it, that's a whole nother monster. It represented people, a mindset that were just committed to fighting and helping me restore truth and restore justice, Innocence Project. It, means everything to me. I feel like they are my umbilical cord to this new life that I'm experiencing. Without them, I wouldn't be anything. Please join us in welcoming the men and exonerated and freed by the Innocence Project this year. Clemente Aguirre was wrongfully imprisoned for 14 years in Florida, including 10 years on death row. Clemente. Thank you. Hugh Burton was wrongfully in prison for 19 years and spent 10 years on parole in New York State. <laughs> Kevin Lackey was wrongfully in prison for 22 years and served two years on parole in Michigan. Ernest Saunier was wrongfully imprisoned for 23 years in Texas. Perry James Lott was wrongfully imprisoned for 30 years in Oklahoma. John Earl Nolly was wrongfully in prison for 19 years and spent two years waiting dismissal of the charges after his release on bond in Texas. Archie Williams was wrongfully in prison for 38 years in Louisiana. The men on this stage with us served a combined years of 181 years of wrongful conviction. Nothing can ever replace the time lost to repair the injustice they endured. We are gratified and honored that they share their time with us to let us welcome them home this evening.
It is my pleasure to ask those innocent people who endure a wrongful conviction and choose to join us on stage to come forward. Herman Atkins, 12 years, California. <laughs> Dewey Boswell, 26 years, New York. Matthew Bruner, 25 years, New Jersey. DeMarco Carpenter, 22 years, Oklahoma. Steve Carrington, 23 years, New York. Angel Cardo, 13 years, New York. Greg Counts, 27 years, New York. And tonight, observing the first anniversary of his innocent exoneration one year ago today. Mark Denny, 30 years, New York. Jeff Desovic, 16 years, New York. Anthony DiPipidio, 20 years, New York. Cornelius Dupree, 30 years, Texas. Cy Green, 22 and a half years, New York. Brian Hensley, 22 years, New Jersey. Derek Hamilton, 21 years, New York. Leroy Harris, 29 years, Connecticut. Johnny Cappy, 25 years, New York. Scott Hornoff, six and a half years, Connecticut. Noah Jackson, 11 years, Tennessee. Calvin Johnson, 16 years, in Georgia. Clifford Jones, 20, 29 years, New York. Eric Kelly, 24 years, New Jersey. Keon, Kapit, Keon Katipi, nine and a half years, New Jersey. Ralph Lee, 24 years, New Jersey. Scott Lewis, 20 years, Connecticut. Antron McCray, six years, New York. Stephanie Morant, 20 years, Connecticut. Hubert Murray, 29 years, New York. And Alan Newton, 22 years, New York. Anthony Ortiz, 20 years, New York. Peter Oko, 18 years, Kenya. Darnell Phillips, 27 years, Virginia. Gerard Richardson, 20 years, New Jersey. Kevin Richardson, five and a half years, New York. Rodney Roberts, 18 years, New Jersey. Felipe Rodriguez, 27 and a half years, New York. Youssef Salam, six and a half years, New York. Carlos Sanchez, 24 and a half years, New York. Raymond Santana, five years, New York. Shabaka Shakur, 27 and a half years, New York. David Shepard, 11 and a half years, New Jersey. Daniel Tapia, 12 years, Louisiana. Betty Ann Waters, in memory of her brother Kenny Waters, 18 and a half years, Massachusetts. Corey Wise, 12 years, New York. Tony Wright, 25 years, Pennsylvania. 
And finally, Marvin Anderson, 20 years, Virginia. Thank you to our honorees for being with us. <laughs> David. That's David Shepard, New Jersey. Thank you to our honorees for being with us tonight and for being such an indispensable part of our work. Please join me to thank everyone on the team here at the Sheraton who've been serving us this evening. Thank all of you for your hard work. Um, and of course, the, uh, the exonerees are um, our inspiration, but all of you make our work possible, make this possible. Uh, you have our thanks, and we wish you a wonderful night. Take care. <laughs>